all the participants in China and good afternoon to colleagues joining from the UK. I'm Manhui Ko, Communications Lead at the UK Research and Innovation China Office. Welcome to the UK China Soil and Sustainable Development Series Lectures. We will host four lectures throughout this month in collaboration with our Chinese partner FAS. And you are now at the first lecture of this series, focusing on criticism science. For the next hour, we will first hear from the British Embassy and UKRI representatives giving opening remarks. Then we will invite Professor Paul Hallett from the University of Aberdeen and Professor Gan Lin Zhang from Chinese Academy of Sciences to share their research collaboration on criticism science and sustainable agriculture, following with a Q&A session in the end. Please note today's session will be in English and grateful if you could write down any comments or questions in the chat box in English so that our UK presenter can better communicate with you all. Thanks. Now first, please allow me to share the screen and play the pre-recorded video for the opening remarks. Please bear with me. Uh, can you all see it and hear it? We can hear you, but uh, no video. Oh, okay. Um, Maybe our colleagues at FAST can help share the opening remarks video, please. I will stop sharing then. Let me share mine, Coco, wait a minute. Okay, thank you, Stella. Can you see that? Yes. Great. Thank you. We Beauty. can't hear the sounds though. So maybe if co-share or um, fast colleagues can help play it because you, you play this previously. Stella, I think you need to stop sharing so fast or co-share colleagues can okay. share their screen. Yeah, sorry everyone about this technical hiccup. <laughs> Oh, it's still there. Sorry. Hello, Shiliang. Can you can you can you share the video, please? Thank you. Still no sound. Oh yeah, we can hear it now, but the volume might need to be increased. That is why it's been a major area of focus in UK and Chinese science and innovation. 
we came together at COP26 and look forward to COP15. And just last month in August, Chinese Vice Minister Zhang Taolin of the Ministry of Agriculture visited the UK. An agreement was made to strengthen cooperation in sustainable agricultural development. We look forward to deeper collaboration on agricultural agriculture between the two countries. This year marks the 50th anniversary of UK-China ambassadorial relations. Over the years, the UK and China have forged a strong and long-lasting partnership with business, culture, education and innovation. So it is right that we look back and celebrate some of our best partnerships and what they mean to the UK, China and the world. Today, you will hear about some of the work between the UK and China that was supported by the Newton Fund. Since 2014, this has brought together hundreds of experts from the UK and China to tackle the most pressing challenges of our time. This series of joint lectures will showcase some of these remarkable partnerships and what they have achieved. Lastly, a thank you to the organisers and to the esteemed presenters of this lecture. I wish you all the best. I'm delighted to introduce this lecture series on UK-China soil and sustainable development research in collaboration with Frontiers of Agricultural Science and Engineering. Soil health is our wealth and ensuring food security and safety is an issue of vital importance to people in the UK and elsewhere. As arable land becomes scarcer and populations grow, China, with its leading expertise and burgeoning research infrastructure, is a natural partner on these issues and has become the UK's third largest single country partner for collaborative research. UKRI has played a key role in facilitating the delivery of excellent collaborative research with impact and well-established relationships with China's major research and innovation funders. This has allowed for an evidence-based approach to developing joint research and innovation collaboration with China that will benefit the UK, both countries and the world. UKRI's Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, BBSRC, has led on our work with China in important areas of research. Over the years, we've invested more than 43 million in 90 projects around food security, from new rice varieties to safety in pork. Joint UK Chinese bioscience research is helping to deliver a safe and nutritious and sustainable food supply. This year is an important year as it also marks the 15th anniversary of UK rice footprint in China. The anniversaries present an opportunity for us to reflect and celebrate the impact of our joint UK Orion China research programs and to look forward to areas for collaboration between us that will be vital in ensuring we continue to work together on crucial areas including climate, health, the net zero agenda and beyond by catalyzing, convening and investing in joint partnerships with China. So throughout this September, you'll be hearing from four fascinating, impactful projects in soil and sustainable development research funded by UKRI and the Newson Fund, from joint centres in agricultural nitrogen to using critical zone science for China and UK sustainable agriculture and more. I really want to thank the organisers and all of the wonderful presenters that participated in this lecture series, and I wish you all a really fruitful discussion later today. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Grace Perry, the Science and Technology Councillor here at the British Embassy in Beijing. Hi. Okay, thanks. Now, before we hear from Professor Hallett, I will now hand over to Professor Ganlin Zhang first to introduce himself and his work on the CZO projects briefly. Professor Zhang, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kogo. Well, um, good evening and good afternoon. Well, I, I'm uh, Ganlin Zhang uh, from uh, Institute of Geography and Limnology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, I'm also a research a soil scientist from uh, the Institute of Soil Science, Chinese Academy of Sciences. 
So I'm very pleased to be invited to join this very interesting session. Well, um, during the during 2015, uh, 2016, and 2021, um, a critical zone research project was co-founded by National Science Foundation of China, together with uh, it is counterpart and NERC in UK. So this project aimed to understand all important processes, mainly what and nutrient processes, their transformation, their translocation within this surface earth system and uh, aimed to provide important solutions for the sustainable development and the sustainable use of soil and water resources. Well, after, after uh, this project uh, uh, involved more than 50 researchers from both countries and more than 100 master and PhD students. So um, the project was very fruitful and it ended up with many new results, new understandings, and also useful tools, which can be used for by farmers and also by policy makers. Well, um, I was I was acting. I was uh, the coordinate coordinate in China side, and uh, Professor Paul Hallett was the coordinator from the UK side. So I'm very pleased to introduce. Uh, Paul Hallett, and I think now we uh, give the time to uh, Hallett, Prophet Hallett, um, to uh, um, give the presentation on the whole project. Paul, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Ganlin. Um, my name is Paul Hallett from the University of Aberdeen. So Ganlin's given me a great introduction. Um, so I was the um, coordinator with him on one of the projects, which is the Red Soil Project, but I'll just share my screen, hopefully. Oops, sorry. <laughs> it was going. Um, and what Ganlin and I want to talk about today is not just the project we're involved in, but all of the projects funded underneath this critical zone science um, program which is looking at sustainable agriculture. And if you look at the list here, the team was absolutely vast. Um, there were many people across a range of disciplines in both um, China and the UK. And as is typical to critical zone science, we see a lot of different disciplines here. So geology, biogeochemistry, soil science, atmospheric science, biology, and also social sciences within this. So as I go through the slides, you'll see various people credited um, as we show different people's work. Now, it's not just this team of investigators that were responsible, as Ganlin mentioned. There were a wide body of other people working on the project. So these were the PhD students, the postdocs, and other researchers who were brought in. And this shows just a subset of us at one of our project meetings that we had um, in Guiyang. Now, you might ask why would China want to link with the UK and why would the UK want to link with China? I'll take one of the disciplines in critical zone science, which is soil science. So this is just a look at web of science over the past 10 years. And what you can see is we look at the total number of publications, China by far leads the world. So 26% of all the papers written with the word soil in it came from China. The UK competes very well with similarly sized countries like Germany. But when we look at research impact on this, there were 5,000 highly cited papers within this. China produced over a third of those. The UK produced 18%. So together, we're producing over half of the highly cited work in soils in the world. We also have a big um, presence in terms of the soil science community. So just this year, we hosted the World Congress of Soil Science in Glasgow. And the next World Congress of Soil Science in 2026 is going to be held in Nanjing. So what I'd like to talk about then is the background to all of the UK um, China CZO projects, what we found across the sites, how we took those data and then did integrated modeling, 
And then a new aspect of critical zone science, which is bringing in people and then taking the science and going beyond the fundamental understanding it provides to look at how we can have impacts on both society and the environment. So if we go back to the original aim of the project, I won't read this out, but degradation of soil and water scarcity jump out. Now, these are some of the biggest threats facing humanity at present. Um, all countries are being affected by it. And we had a really nice scenario to look at in China because of the very rapid um, growth in industry and also the shifts in populations as well. And the critical zone, zone approach gave us a unique way to look at this. So the image on the left is what we typically think of when we think of this critical zone. It extends from the bottom of the groundwater right down to the parent material rock, all the way up to the atmosphere above. And rather than look at different sections in isolation, it brings together different teams to get an integrated understanding of environmental and ecosystem processes. Now, originally, critical zone observatories were set up as a way to understand how natural environments involved. But many of the environments around the world have been um, affected quite considerably by human land use. So the image on the right, which is an adaptation by Larissa Naylor at the University of Glasgow, shows how our new landscapes have this human intervention, which then will impact how they function. And if we think about this critical zone, then we're looking at this interaction between land and water. We can also look at how it delivers food. And by doing this, we can also tackle a range of sustainable development goals. So within China, there were five projects that were funded. These were in four different geographic regions, going from the Northwest down to the Southeast. And I'll just give a brief overview on all of these different projects um, right now. So the one that Ganlin and I were involved with was the Red Soil CZ project. The picture of the big profile with the person in it is 20 years old. And it's actually Professor Xinhua Peng when he was a PhD student. And it reflects how long some of these collaborations have been going on for. We weren't new partners in many of these. We'd known each other for a long time. Now this project very much took the structure of a standard critical zone observatory. It was a confined catchment and this was heavily instrumented and we could look at everything coming in and everything coming out of that catchment. So the region is covered with red soils, as you'd expect. So these are ultisols or acrosol soils. They are highly weathered. They're prone to erosion and acidification. And there are also aspects with nutrient depletion and soil structure um, related to depletions in soil organic carbon. These are really important because they cover about 23% of China's land area. So it's a quite a large chunk, but 40% of the population lives there. So it's very important for food production. So we look within this catchment, installed in it by the team in China were a huge array of different instrumentation where they'd been collecting data for over 10 years, starting with the soil truck project. So we had a good database to look back on and then to um, supplement and complement with the current project. Up at the other end of China, Northwest China is the lowest critical zone project. So this, these are soils which form from basically wind-blown aeolian material. So they're quite fragile and um, very susceptible to erosion. It's where the Grain for Green program has been put in place. And we have huge areas of land restoration in place. So this is an area suffering from quite high soil erosion and also nutrient leaching and water availability is also a big challenge within this area. Now, they took a slightly different approach than we did at the red soil um, experiments. They were looking at the whole entire Lewis Plateau region. And the first thing they did is using principal comp component analysis of geographic and also land use um, um, aspects of the site. They were able to identify eight different areas that defined their critical zones. And by sampling within these different eight critical zones, they were able to get a broad regional understanding of the processes. The other um, site we looked at were Karst, uh, was the Karst region. So this is in Southwest China. These are, are very thin soils that form over limestone. We have soil erosion from the surface and also soil erosion just from falling in between 
some of these chasms to get created as the limestone is weathering. So they're very thin, nutrient-poor soils. And within these, we had two projects funded. One of these was the hydrocarst project. So this one was looking mainly at hydrological processes and threats. So it's looking at how water is used and how humans are impacting the surrounding water. Within this karst environment, because the um, parent material is like Swiss cheese, it's very open, we've got incredibly fast flow of water from land systems over into the surrounding water. The other project funded there was Spectra Karst. So Spectra Karst was more focused on soils. So it was conducted mainly at this Pudding Karst Ecosystem Research Station. And they looked at soil erosion and fertility and why the soils were so poorly productive and ways that they could improve the soil and tipping points due to um, rocky desertification. The final project is outside Ningbo City. So it's the peri-urban critical zone project. And this is a very different purpose to the projects I mentioned already, which we're very much looking at broader scale regional impacts and kind of traditional farming practices. This site was looking at peri-urban farming systems and what their big aim was, was the circular economy. So with the waste that's being produced within Ningbo City or other cities where um, similar work is conducted, they want to reuse that, basically produce fertilizers from it and apply that to land. Now, although this is excellent in terms of replenishing nitrogen or other fertilizers, there are risks of antimicrobials and other compounds entering into the soil. So they were looking at how these move through the environment and any potential risk. So within this, we've got um, very broad geological differences between the different critical zones that were funded. And these broad um, geological differences coupled with the way the land is used and pressures from population and whatever else creates a range of environmental challenges. And ones that really jumped out at us were fertilizer use, erosion, and water abstraction. And very much within this peri-urban site, there was also um, contamination and water reuse as well. So let's look now at what we found between some of these different sites. The one thing that was um, common to all of these projects is we wanted to get a deep understanding. And that's at both um, sides of the definition, both depth in terms of our depth of understanding, but they actually dug incredibly deep at some of these sites. So within the karst, very shallow soils, it may have been centimeters to meters depth with the analysis, peri-urban down to meters, red soils are highly weathered. They're up over 10 meters deep in some places. We went deeper there. And then the lowest plateau went to these incredible depths of hundreds of meters. So when we think of this then, this is work from the lowest plateau where I think the sampling that went on is some of the most impressive I've ever seen. They went and dug or, or took very, very deep soil cores at um, six different locations across this lowest plateau region. So you can see them here. And in this, they measured a huge array of physical and chemical parameters. And they, from this, they were able to get whole stocks for the whole region of these different compounds and understand the flow and transport properties and various environmental threats which may not have even been known about before this research. Now, coupling these boreholes were also um, uh, more sites where they went down to shallower depth. And by doing this and using a range of pedo transfer functions, they were able to map out the depth of soil and then the mass of soil across the whole entire lowest plateau. So in this paper, they came out with a mass of lowest plateau soil of 5.45 times 10 to the 13 tons. So why is that important? Because having this knowledge of the whole entire soil profile then lets us account for what is being stored and what may be escaping from that environment as well. When we go to the red soil then, um, this is work that was um, done mainly by Shodan Zong, they looked at the depth of the soil in this region using typical approaches of augers and boreholes complemented with geophysical approaches like ground penetrating radar. 
So they're able to map out what the underlying material was like, and they're able to also look at how deep the soils were in the area. Now, with this work, they mapped out the depth of bedrock, they mapped out how deep the weathered rock was, and then they looked at the current topography as well. And what was really amazing from this is despite the Cretaceous paleotopography, which formed so long ago, they found that there was still an impact on the surface topography that we see today. In the, in the, sorry, the red soil region, we looked at many more things. So this is just looking at nitrogen and where it is stored. So usually when we're looking at soil properties, we limit ourselves to quite shallow soil. With the critical zone approach, we went much deeper all the way down to the bedrock. And by doing an accounting of the amount of nitrogen, we found that 80 to 90% of it was stored from one to eight meters depth. And looking at it in greater depth then, using X-ray CT imaging, where we can look at the pore structure in the soil, and then also looking at the um, depth profile of um, different nutrients, we're able to find a very close link between the transport of that nitrogen and the macro pore structure of the soil, which would act like motorway channels where um, things like fertilizers and other pollutants could move very quickly through the regolith. If we go to the karst area, again, the team there was also looking at nitrogen and they upscaled to this karst landscape and predicted there's a possibility of about one to 1.7 million tons of nitrogen loss. And this occurs mainly in the wet season and mainly the subsurface facilitated by that large open structure that's formed by this limestone rock that forms the underlying parent material for these soils. Now, this is the one you're gonna to need to look at very closely. So if you look at the y-axis of that graph in the middle, that is in meters. So we're going down to over 200 meters in um, Shangwu. And in this, by looking at these five different boreholes, they predicted that there was 0.2 to 1 billion tons of mineral N stored within the lowest plateau. And this required a huge amount of sample analysis. Every single one of these points in these figures is an individual sample that one of the investigators would have measured and then compiled um, for this result. So we generated a heap of data. I've just shown you a snapshot based on nutrients and based on how the critical zones form, but we looked at microbial populations, we looked at aspects with crop productivity, we looked at carbon cycling in a great deal of depth, and we looked at how the soils formed and also how they eroded over time. But we took that data and used it for integrated modeling. So within the first phase of the critical zone project, the team within the Lowest Plateau came up with this modeling framework. So this brought together a range of different models. It was aimed primarily at policy people, and it was a way to look at ways to optimize land use and land practices to minimize environmental risks. So within the process models that are shown within the middle here, one of these was SPAXIS. It's a model of nutrient cycling and crop productivity. And by running this model, they could look at where nutrient use efficiency could be improved in the region. We also applied different modeling within the red soil region. So this shows the application of a model called the COS that was developed at the University of Aberdeen to look at soil organic carbon storage if there was a shift to afforestation or the planting of trees within this region. Now, because the project had many people from different disciplines, the environmental modeler could work with a hydrological modeler. And if we look at the ACOS model here, this is the modeled um, soil moisture versus measured soil moisture. With the ACOS model, there's some simplifications in how we look at soil water. We can take a soil physics model, which is hydrous, apply that instead to get a better prediction between the model and the measure, and therefore improve the quality of the modeling that we're conducting. And this is important if we look at CO2 efflux from that land using the original version of a cost versus 
the hydrous um, improved version of the cost, we get 16% greater CO2 emissions. So through this improvement of the model, we're looking at different predictions um, of land use practices. What we also did within these projects is brought in people. And this was um, really led by teams at Glasgow and Sterling, working together with our investigators within China. And what they did in this is they looked at what do people need? So these are these stakeholder surveys and consultations. They would um, present information from the project to these people as a way to disseminate the information. They would get feedback from the audience about their understanding, and then they would reflect and learn on these activities as well. So surveys were conducted across most of the critical zone regions um, that I've mentioned. And these were done primarily by um, students on the ground within China and then assistance from some of the teams in the UK. So this shows what farmers think. So I'm showing examples here for red soil versus the karst region. So do farmers think their activities affect surrounding land? Well, the karst region, there's a bit of a better understanding of it. They could do with the extent of soil degradation that you may see in that region, but there's still a large number who don't really appreciate how the activities on their land may have impacts on land away from them. Then where do the people learn about soil erosion? So karst is on the left, red soil is on the right, and there's a portion who've never learned about it. Many people have learned about it through their family. There's a bit of people who've learned about it through government or through extension work, and many of them have taught themselves through daily practice as well. What we did find is that there was a bit of a disconnect between farmers and scientists. So within these regions, there is a dissemination of information up from provincial level, down through village leaders and down to farmers, but there's a disconnect back from the scientists to get that back to the farmers. So we looked at different ways to improve this type of communication, which is helpful to this type of advisory work and common to agriculture all over the world. So with further questions, we asked them about what are your challenges and what are your big costs that you're facing? So there's a range of different um, challenges and costs they looked at. One of them is fertilizers. So this jumps out as the biggest cost to all, far to all farmers. And they also have a challenge on how can I optimize the application of these fertilizers to minimize those costs? And from our standpoint, therefore minimize the environmental impacts from it. Another one is water. So water for irrigation cost them a bit, but it was one of the huge challenges that they have in terms of their farming practices. So what we found in this is we've got an example where there's rapid expansion. We've got intensive land use. We've got a rapid change in the populations with urbanization. And we found that the structure of this critical zone interacts quite heavily with how the human works with it as well. So we have common themes of limited resources. We want to use less fertilizers, but still get adequate yield out. And by doing this, we get less pollution, but also it's a lower cost. So to the farmers, there's a potential to have greater income as well. Water is limited. So by having greater water use efficiency, we should be able to improve crop productivity. And then we have this disconnect between science and practice in terms of knowledge. This brought us on to a next phase of the project. So in the original projects, China had four years of funding and the UK had three, and we had follow-on funding to take that science that we had and try to put it into impact to help address this disconnect between what we're getting in this very in-depth science and then what farmers may need as well. And currently in China, there's some follow-on projects running where they're looking at these critical zone um, processes in much greater depth. So we had this project called MITS funded. And within this, we employed a range of new postdoctoral scientists. So this brought in some new expertise and also some of our existing expertise. So there are some environmental modelers within this. Um, we have the same coordinator as the original project. We also brought in experts in social sciences and experts in economics. So again, 
in the first project, the Lois Plateau team came up with this um, uh, model, which integrated a lot of the science that we were exploring um, as a way to come up with extremely good regional-based policy decisions. But this is some way away from what a farmer would be able to use out on the field. So there's still that disconnect between science and practice. There's other tools that we can use called decision support tools, which allow for actual access by farmers. So one of the tools that was developed at University of Aberdeen is the Cool Farm Tool. And this is a very simple online tool that farmers can use to look at their environmental impact on agriculture. It uses data that farmers can get easily, and it gives them good advice so that they can understand those offsite impacts where they may have poor understanding and ways to improve their practices. So this is it applied to the red soil region, and we're looking at the emissions um, due to the production of peanuts here. So in this, we can look at what is causing the emissions. So for peanuts, soil fertilizers are, are causing the greatest amount of emissions from the land. And then also because they're applying fertilizers, their production um, has some impact as well. This is peanuts, so that's 2.35 um, kilograms of CO2 equivalent. If we go to rice, it bumps up to um, almost eight kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And much of that we can find is contributed by paddy methane. So by having these flooding paddy systems, we're therefore contributing to greenhouse gases within those areas. We looked at all of the decision support tools that are available across the world and came up with a huge number of them. These look at a range of different processes or, or practices. So how much you get off the land in terms of livestock or crop is very much at the heart of many of them. Finances is obviously very big as well. And then there are a few of them that look at things like carbon or biodiversity, where they're looking at the environmental impacts. But what we didn't see were models that integrated between all these different aspects together. So what we we're interested in doing then is combining an agronomic model, an economic model, and an environmental model to then come up with a really holistic set of decision support tools that would then be beneficial either at policy level or potentially um, directly for farmers. So the first thing we did is we took um, critical zone data, mainly based on the parent material that formed that critical zone, and used it to look at the impacts of crop yield. And we did this for one of the critical zones in the karst region where the data um, was available. So within this, we came up with uh, artificial neural networks to explore this. So there are a range of different properties that we looked at based on the slope of the land, uh, which we could get from digital um, elevation maps, the weather, some uh, various properties of the soil, and also the agronomy. So we got all of these different properties. We put it through this um, complex neural network and then we could look at how a range of different crops were therefore affected by these critical zone properties. So this shows a range of crops down on um, the x-axis, and then we're looking at how much these different factors shown by different colors on the right had an influence on them. So if we look at um, something like rice, well, we can see that irrigation water is quite important because it's often grown in a flooded condition. Whereas when we look at something like rapeseed, um, which isn't irrigated, it doesn't have an influence within that. But we could look at the climatic features, which have the dominant role, and also our nutrients that we add to the soil, which are dominant, but all summed up together, we can see this critical zone affecting different um, crop yields in different ways, depending on the crop. So this shows an example then, on crop yields across um, the Guizhou province. And you can see that we've got these regions which are orange, where we have high potential yield, and the regions that are much more in green, where there's low potential yield. And remember this figure when I start showing some data um, in the next few slides on the economics. So we've got much more productive regions in some parts of uh, Guizhou than in others. So we wanted to take this kind of information then 
and put economics into this. So this is work that was really um, led from the University of Exeter and also Peking University. So we've got this critical zone science where we could look at all of the underlying biophysical components. We've also got an economic valuation of this. And this is what we get off the land in terms of yield or whatever else, but also the ecosystem services provided by that land as well. We could look at the cost and benefits of these. And then by looking through different scenarios of minimizing environmental impacts while maintaining food supply, we could come up with a way to start to optimize the land use um, in that area. So this shows an output from the model. And what it's showing is where can we decrease the amount of production, but still maintain that crop yield by having increases in production in other regions. So if we look at it for, um, for this region in the karst area, we can see that these higher yielding regions that we found before, by putting more focus into those, we can increase yields quite considerably. And by decreasing it just marginally down here, we can still maintain food production, but decrease the environmental impact quite considerably for that region. So what we've done in this work then, is we've looked at critical zone science. We've done it in the context of a human modified landscape where we've got intensive farm, farming in practice, a range of different um, parent materials and geologies forming it, and using this incredibly deep monitoring of things like nitrogen and carbon and water and the structure of these critical zones, we've managed to get a much deeper understanding. All of those data have been put together through integrated modeling, and by doing this, we can start to look at the impact from it. So we've gone from the science to the impact where we're looking at humans as part of this critical zone. We've developed these decision support tools to make tools which are accessible, not only by highly skilled people at policy level, but also down on the ground by individual farmers. And we've combined environment and economics as a way to not only optimize systems for the environment, but also to preserve it for food production and economic well-being as well. And by doing that, it's given us this ability to tackle things like sustainable development goals in much greater detail. So thank you very much for listening. I'll now hand back to Ganlin um, for questions. Thank you, Paul. I think this is a very um, um, complete and, uh, and also of, uh, meanwhile, uh, um, highlights the, the important important um, points, both in uh, the the cross cross site fundings and uh, the um, the the uh, modeling tools that can be used for the management of um, for better management of the soil and the water and uh, and and the uh, uh, resources, especially on um, Fertilizer use and management. So um, perhaps we can uh, have some questions. Uh, if we have some questions from the audience, and then we uh, both, uh, you and I, we, we are ready to answer. I see that there's one from the from the dialogue. Do you see that, uh, Paul? Do you see that? I see a question on the interactive signal pathway between the protist and microbiome. Is that it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll hand that one to you, Ganlin, to answer. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it's, uh, it is, we have a lot of people from the project on, on the call. Um, neither Ganlin or I are microbiologists. Um, so if anybody wants to answer that, um, please do. <laughs> it, it is tough for me either. <laughs> well, um. Um, actually, I, I kind of, I kind of, I, I cannot answer this question because I'm not really a biologist on a soil biologist on this. Um, um, sorry, I, I have to say sorry about this. Uh, do we have some? Do we have some uh, some colleagues from the audience can can try to also can answer this question? Ah, okay. He says he uh, says uh, wrong address wrong wrongly. So so we. We, we do not need to, to answer that question. 
as we as we wait for another question, um, what I will say about the projects, particularly in the Perry Urban um, project, is there was incredibly detailed um, microbiology that was conducted. So there's full molecular characterization of the microbiome um, all the way down through the critical zone. Um, Lois Plata was another um, area where they characterized incredibly deep and found quite surprising kind of peaks of microbial communities very deep within the Lois Plata. And we had um, similar findings within the red soil region um, related a lot to the soil structure. So there is yes. a very good microbial understanding from these projects. Yes. So we, we drilled to, uh, to a depth of about 10 meters. And even there, we found uh, uh, a bunch of um, uh, micro, microbial activities. We, we, uh, we could identify many types of uh, micro, microbes, uh, microbes there. So let's see, other question? How does the question, can NBS be integrated into the search of CZ? So I'm assuming NBS is nature-based solutions. Uh, and could be, um, uh, yeah, it should be. Yeah, I mean, the answer is definitely yes. And again, um, if we consider both, uh, in fact, all of the critical zones, they all had restoration processes um, that were investigated. Um, within it, either directly in the CZO or on land that was um, quite close to it. And um, when you have a nature-based solution, you'll therefore be changing many of these critical zone processes, and it provides an incredibly good way to get an integrated understanding. Um, and I think if we look at areas such as restoration of um, Los Plato and also the Red Soil region, many of these aspects were picked up in the data that we um, collected. Thank you. So do we have any more questions? Yes, please do write down any questions or comments. It's very um, exciting that we have both the UK and Chinese PIs of the projects here with us today. And um, I've noticed that we've had more than 2,000 and uh, 200 audiences online watching this. So yeah, please do let us know if there's any more questions or comments. Hello, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm a student from China Agricultural University, and I I, I have I have one question to ask you. Uh, in terms of the technologies and the methods, uh, what are the differences between China and the, the United Kingdom in investigating the soil crit critical zone? So within this project, um, there was some expertise, particularly uh, via Steve Benward, who's one of the PIs and some of the other ones in terms of establishing critical zone observatories because they had previous experience in other countries um, setting them up. But I think the, the expertise was complementary, um, that we managed to enhance it quite a bit, particularly with uh, much of the biogeochemistry um, expertise um, from China to come up with an even better type of program um, from this. So it's very much integrated work between both sides. And I think by working together, it allowed for a kind of deeper understanding um, to be uh, established between both teams. Yes, uh, the research sites, the field sites are located in China, but the, the technologies we, we adopted um, well, the expertise um, uh, used in this project are coming from both sides, especially on, um, I, I think, the, the, as, as Paul just mentioned, um, the uh, isotope method and also the geophysical method, for example, the um, um, uh, electro, electro, 
uh, ET, uh, uh, power ET used in cast to uh, to uh, map the map the, the depths of soil along the, the transect, which was introduced from uh, our, our UK and uh, scientists. I think, for, yeah. So so the um, the the both side exchange ideas and, and uh, uh, they selected uh, the um, most advanced technologies uh, for this study. So one thing Gua, we were hoping for from this was setting up a lot of critical zone observatories in the UK. Um, so if anyone from UK or I is listening, that would be an excellent thing to do and it would um, use our expertise um, from this type of project. And uh, Paul, there are two more questions coming out. So um, the first one is, what is your perspective after this study on developing sustainable agriculture in China? And this is something where uh, in China, um, due to some many recent policy changes, it's fairly rosy because there have been fast changes in things like fertilizer use. And um, so, you know, I think there's a positive trajectory on there. Um, as with many regions, agriculture is creating quite a threat to the environment. Um, and I think with this type of understanding where we're looking at everything from soil formation to its degradation, we can start to come up with more solutions and also policy advice, I guess, that was going to have the best impact on practices. Um, because it has a more integrated understanding than just looking at one part of the challenge. So I think, um, yeah, this definitely is one bit that contributes to developing sustainable agriculture, not only in China, but um, in any region, because much of the research is transferable. Um, so there is a positive trajectory from that. Okay, the next question is a PhD question. So, so if you're about to do your PhD defense, you're gonna get this question. What are the next steps for this work? And if you had any amount of money um, or funding to support, what would you like? So um, from my perspective, I would like to set up a set of critical zone observatories across the UK as well. So some of these are being set up, but I think we could have a broader network established. And those would definitely benefit from continued input um, with our colleagues in China because it brings in a lot of expertise that we don't have. And it brings in a lot of experience because that's where a lot of the on the ground work was conducted as well. Um, and then this is highly integrated work. So I mean, you can study these processes forever and still not understand them. So I think there's a, a lot that we can still look at with this and try to integrate different components together much better and expand the critical zone network within China as well, which I think is currently underway up in black soil regions and other regions. I don't know, Gandlin, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, I, I think um, um, uh, well, I think the, the, um, the research objectives of CZ um, can be more than uh, for the agriculture. So for example, um, how ecosystem will respond to climate change? And uh, in this uh, this point, we didn't we didn't uh, focus much in the last period of of research. And for the future, if we we could continue, I think this could be a important uh, theme for for the future research. Yeah, that that's my uh, uh, comment. So something we only touched on on this project was the social sciences and the economic impacts. And that also produced some quite exciting findings. So it's basically putting economics into critical zone science. So we've got this huge integrated understanding combined with what are the costs, both financially and also you know, the economic costs to environmental impacts. Same to the audience. Okay. Sorry. Per, per, this is Ying. Thank you for your beautiful presentation, Per. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
If, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yes. hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, I have one quick. I was uh, interested in your talk about put uh, economic uh, perspective in critical zone size. Uh, in terms of this, uh, there are also another huge research area to investigate the water food energy nexus. Uh, so do you have any idea like to consider the WEF nexus? research into the critical zone size. So thanks for the question, Ying. Um, yeah, so as I think the, um, I showed a diagram with the sustainable development goals. So this very much is at the heart of this water, was well, water and food and land nexus is what we had. We didn't have energy really as part of it. Um, but um, I think that's a, you know, an excellent kind of framework to use for future work is to look at how all these different processes are, are linked together. You can see in that um, cool farm tool output, things like um, emissions due to fertilizer production are accounted for within that. So that is moving towards that as well. But I think there would be a long way to go and it would be a really exciting um, avenue for research. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I think, uh... That uh, could be very new cutting edge research area, like uh, to combine something between two research areas. Yeah. No, thank I you. totally agree. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. While we wait for the next quest question, Ying was probably standing behind me when I took the picture of Xinhua Peng 20 years ago. So he was a PhD student as well at the Institute of Soil Science in Nanjing. <laughs> so therefore, yeah. for your next presentation, you maybe put my picture there as well as you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hello, Paul. I have a question. I should what? Hello, Paul. Hey, long, long time to see you. Yeah, um, this is Shenhua. I have a, I have a one question. Uh, for you, thank you, Paul. And long time see you. Uh, thank you for the introduction of, of um, on the topic of deep um, deep accumulation of nitrogen. You know, we have some we have to we have, we have done some research on the uh, deep accumulation of nitrogen. Uh, and uh, I I remember that you have a suggest you have a suggestion to me that we uh, I could have uh, we have we we could get a nature paper if. We, we try to uh, estimate uh, the nitrogen accumulation uh, from data on the regolith structure, uh, soil properties, and uh, the nitrogen inputs globally. Uh, I think this idea is very good, but uh, I uh, some some reviewers told me that uh, some of the uh, some of the pro uh, some of the uh, properties. Is very dynamic, such as the uh, nitrogen uh, input. So I don't, I don't know how to use uh, use a model with the, you know the regardless the structure is uh, is uh, is steel, but uh, but the nitrogen input is very dynamic. How do we use a model with uh, with uh, data from nitrogen input and uh, soil properties or regardless structure to Estimate the uh, nitrogen uh, stock of the whole regardless globally. Thank you. So I, I can't I, I can't remember <laughs> making this suggestion um, <laughs> directly. Um, I mean the the weakness in all this is we don't have the data. So it's um, what well, you can see from those critical zone projects, and you were directly involved um, in the red soil one was there were lots of unknowns that are now knowns in terms of sampling at depth and getting ass assessments of this nitrogen stock. And when I showed those total values, you also noticed there was quite a big bandwidth between it. So, you know, the estimates were quite broad um, because it is so difficult to do. So I don't think any of this would be feasible without more measurements um, 
of what is actually moved through the structure because it is so dynamic, as you mentioned. So this is where I think setting up more investigations like this, where we go beyond this one meter depth and look right through down to the regolith or whatever is, is necessary before we can start to make big predictions like this. And that's why it becomes a nature paper because it is so hard to do. Yes. I think Thank you. Very Thank you, Paul. I think the, the plan time is uh, almost up. So I, I think, uh, thank you for your nice presentation and also thank all the audience and also for those um, uh, people who raised questions, those, those uh, colleagues. And um, so, uh, Man Hui, do you have any more to, to, to say? Uh, yeah, thank moment. you very yeah. much, Professor Zhang and Paul, for your comprehensive presentation and the Q&A. And we are really excited to see that we've had some old friends from the projects. So it's really great. And we've had so many audiences join us online as well, like more than uh, 2,000 uh, audiences. So this is really great. And secure food production for present and future generations really relies on the healthy soil and the sustainable usage of resources, which has been a really a big focus of our UKRI and Newton Fund work here. And we hope we can have more resources and opportunities to continue this really important work, which can benefit both countries and beyond. Um, I just want to mention that we've uh, prepared some gifts for the audiences. And if you could uh, fill in this quiz, I just shared the link here in the chat box. So if you can just um, fill in this quiz, then we will select some lucky audiences to send out our gifts. And that's it from me. And thank you all again. Thank you. And uh, uh, Paul, looking forward to meeting you next time. So yes, I don't same know here, you can, Lynn. <laughs> and, and everybody, I, I notice a lot of names on here from China. So I look forward to meeting all of you. The latest next year. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.